and let's get started. So it amazes me the number of motors that come in for repair and the failure issues that they have that could have easily been prevented. We see this every day. To get a clear understanding of preventable, like all of us, I use Google. I threw that in there and I just wanted to throw that in there to keep from occurring, able to be avoided, avertable, correctable, healable, restorable, stoppable, curable, mendable, treatable. I'm here today to say that most causes of motor failures can be stopped in their tracks and are preventable. I know you're sitting there going, this guy's probably nuts. And I am a little bit because I'm born of that guy over there. But uh, my background has been in rebuilding and redesigning and improving motors for over 37 years. I have an electrical engineering background. We see the end result of motors being abused or neglected and not maintained. So we see the end result. Yes, there are some unpreventable failures like motor windings do age with time like everything else and they eventually fail. Rotor bars will eventually crack. All bearings have a calculated lifespan and motors are sized incorrectly so there's other factors that will impact the life of a motor but eventually should be in 15, 20, 25 years, not what we've all come to ex accept as short life, maybe five, 10 or less. We're gonna focus on the bearing area because the 50, 50 or 51 percent of failures are contributed to bearing failures. Uh, so in, in, in this presentation for lack of time, I'm gonna kind of focus on the ball bearing but a lot of what I'm talking about here applies to sleeve bearing as well and other types of bearing configurations. So most studies suggest 80% of the all bearing failures are from improper lubrication, which is, which is crazy to me, but it's the re it really does happen. Improper grease interval might be a cause, a grease path is blocked, not enough grease is pumped into the bearing and understanding how much should be pumped in there to begin with. Um, solutions, proper grease interval, identifying the correct amount of grease and how frequently based on the application, the load, and so on. So just simple grease paths, you know, the, obviously the grease goes in through the zerd, it comes into the cavity there, and then it goes through the bearing into a bearing cap or a cavity on the other side, and then you have a purge or a plug opening. Oops, it's important that Understanding the grease path is really important because it allows you to evaluate the proper amount or quantity of grease. In addition, the grease, you know, a lot of motors, what I'm showing there, a lot of them will have the long tubes. And uh, understanding that, we've had motors come in with failed bearings that the customer was actually greasing, but they didn't fill the tube up or the service center didn't fill the tube up. So the guy was probably putting the right quantity in and all he was doing was filling it in the tube and never got to the bearing. So simple things. Um, regreasable housing using a single shielded bearing, very similar to what we just showed, uh, except that you don't have a reservoir on the other side, grease or purge plug. A big point to make here is when you're greasing, you need to remove the grease plug or the purge opening. If it's just a manual plug, take it off and leave it off for a half a day after you've greased. It isn't gonna hurt anything, just make sure you put it back in. Or use some of those automatic pressure regulating valves that they have out. But uh, otherwise, by not doing that, you build a lot of pressure and you're gonna end up with a situation like this. And believe it or not, this is very common. And you got a guy like that that just pumps away because he doesn't know the, the right quantity and he thinks more is better and he just keeps cranking away and putting more grease into it. You guys probably don't have anybody like that, right? So too much lubricant, pumping too much, uh, and understanding how much is needed and how frequently. Solutions, working with your service center to understand the grease path and, and uh, how much is adequate. It's, it's important that you work with the service center that might be servicing your motors because they're gonna be able to tell you
you know, the right quantity of grease if it isn't given to you from the manufacturer because you might think you're getting enough in there and you're not. So understanding your application, determining the correct grease frequency and so on. So you don't wanna have this happen because over greasing a noisy bearing treats the symptom, not the cause. This can lead to other problems, as you know, like an overheated winding or contaminating the winding to where it actually fails. So I love the auto greasers because it takes the human element out of there. Uh, they can be fitted on most all applications. They just have different configurations. But once you dial in the amount of grease that's necessary, all the tubes are filled, these things work great. You can dial in the frequency, you know, and leave them alone, walk away, and they'll do their job. Automatic greasers can solve most of those over-greasing issues. So mixing incompatible lubricants is another common issue. This picture shows, a, that was a picture of a motor that had two different grease colors, one blue, one brownish. And the point to be made is, you know, what happens is people do their greasing and then they forget what grease should go into that motor. Maybe the motor isn't tagged properly. And so they just grab any grease that's available and they pump it into the motor. Um, but that's not a good thing. You know, pumping anything in there and not knowing what should be in there is, is probably more harmful than not. So uh, understanding which greases are compatible, you can look at charts like this that uh, help you identify compatibility. Um, I don't recommend you, you do that. I recommend you pick a grease and hopefully that works for a wide variety of your machines and don't try to mix or don't try to uh, uh, you know, do that because you're, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna end up having a battle of the, the lubricants and typically you're gonna have a lubrication breakdown. The majority of bearing and motor manufacturers just something that I've been noticing over the last 10, 15 years, use a polyurea base for extreme pressure and they're typically using a mobile polyrex. I'm not selling mobile polyrex, I'm telling you that bearing manufacturers have them in the bearings when they come from the factory and motor manufacturers build their motors and have this type of grease in. It's a very good grease actually. But you may have an application that requires a lithium base or something that you, you need higher temperatures. So it's not the only grease. Contamination is caused by foreign substances or materials getting in. As we all know, they might be getting past the seal fits or some other ways of getting into the motor. Um, depending on the motor environment, contamination can come through the seals, like I said, can uh, come through excessive seal clearance, seals weren't set properly, or washing down of motors, they still do this today, which blows me away, electric motors and water don't mix. Um, and dusty environments and so on, and then dusty applications with bad filtering. So. The foreign substances are usually dirt or sand, abrasive grit, dust, water, which gets through the seals, enters the bearing lubrication system, then causes the damage. This one was interesting. Um, I knew that water and oil or grease didn't mix, but I didn't realize that one drop of water in uh, a quart of oil will reduce the fatigue life by 48%. You know, there, there may be variations of this, but the point is they don't mix and getting that in there will greatly reduce the lubricating effect of the grease or the oil. So just quickly, uh, fatigue process for rolling element, microscopic subsurface metal fractures due to cyclic loading stresses produce thin layers of surface separation and then they start to flake off and it's what we call spalling. And then as it advances, it gets even worse. That's the typical process of what a bearing is gonna look like. So there are gonna be some increase in noise and vibration, clearly. Critical internal dimensional changes occur. Noise, vibration, heat, wear, and more advanced falling becomes unsafe to operate, which leads to catastrophic failure. So how quickly the failure occurs depends on the speed, the time, the temperature, the load, vibration level, and the lubricant, all of these factors. So because 50% of bearings 
or motor failures start as bearing failures, it's important to correctly analyze the failure for the correct root cause to prevent the failure. The problem is when you allow a bearing to fail to this extent, you might lose all the evidence that's available to figure out what might have caused it because the thermal failure is so massive. So evaluating the bearing can be very difficult. So what is fluting? Passing of alternating or direct current through the bearing. Uh, there are various causes of what we call fluting. Uh, shaft circulating currents have been around forever um, in motors before VFDs. Motors have shaft circulating currents from the dissymmetry and the design and the staggering of laminations and some of the mechanical tolerances and all this stuff packed together create a circulating current in the motor. Normally not an issue until you get about 500 horse and up and then you have to start doing something to prevent it. Uh, we, in, our, in our repair facility, we actually measure shaft voltage on every motor that comes in for repair so that we can have an, an understanding of where that machine either is when it came into us and what it is when it leaves. You want to actually measure a shaft voltage, that's a good thing. Um, you can have static charges causing this fluting or damage to bearings where there's discharging going on and causing damage to the bearing. Uh, magnetizing of parts. We also measure a Gauss reading on every motor that comes in. We measure the shaft and the rotor and the end bells and the frame, and we actually identify the amount of Gauss that's there because if the parts get magnetized from welding or some source, that is a generating source for uh, circulating currents, and you have to get rid of it. So we invested in demagnetizing equipment you wrap these cables around the parts and you actually reverse the field and you get rid of the magnetism. So you degauss and then you measure it again to make sure it's gone. Variable frequency drives and switching frequencies cause a lot of havoc. We're gonna talk a little more about it, but this is what it looks like. Fluting is fairly simple to see when you clean the bearing up and cut it and look. You have these evenly spaced, for the most part, lines. Uh, these patterns are very, um, very, uh, they point in the direction of a VFD issue, frosted ball, and then the one in the lower right that's hard to read, that's where like maybe welding occurred and there was electrical uh, uh, pitting and it actually pits like little melted spots in the ball itself. So how do we stop it? The goal is to stop the current by insulating the end bell. That's how they, they do it today and they did it years ago, or by using maybe a ceramic bearing. So what you're doing is you're putting insulation so that that bearing is isolated so that when the circulating current occurs, if there's insulation here, it breaks the path. It's really that simple. It's always on the outboard bearing, not on the inboard bearing. And uh, with the advent of variable frequency drives, this was not enough protection. And even with this type of insulation on an outboard bearing, you still had failures. So. VFD driven motors are what ends up happening is you have, you know, shaft circulating currents take a little bit of time depending on the magnitude and how, how bad they are, but typically they take a little more time. When you add a VFD in there, it actually uh, accelerates that. So a variable frequency drive causes, for simplicity, a funny looking sine wave. It's not. It's, always siding your soil, it's gonna have a lot of peaks with it. And what it does is it induces a circulating current that ends up impacting the motor or the, or the uh, bearings. And the, that type of discharge will actually arc across the oil film, it'll actually burn the grease and it'll cause pitting. So a way to handle that is to use a grounding brush. So what they do is they'll put a grounding brush in parallel and a lot of times the inboard of the bearing and then that grounding brush will divert the path of the current away from the bearing. Um, so using a grounding brush will dissipate the current to ground and uh, it, it, it's, it's saved so many operations with VFDs. Um, we typically use an Aegis system. Again, I'm not saying they're the only, but they're very good at this. And, and one way of doing it on existing motors that are put together is you can install them on the external, but you can also put them internally 
but it works really well and they still recommend leaving that outboard bearing insulated. So the end result of motor failures, you know, is a thermal failure if you let it go too far. The root cause might be too much dirt, too little grease, contamination, high ambient conditions, but the end result is a thermal failure. So to summarize, improper lubrication accounts for about 43% of bearing failures, about 25% are contamination, about 20% are alignment, bearing, mounting, loose, tight fits, seven to 10%, the L10 life, just general fatigue, and then two to 5% from electrical fluting. So it just kind of summarizes what's going